The Blythedale Romance by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Preface. In the Blythedale of this volume, many readers will probably suspect a faint and not very faithful shadowing of Brook Farm in Roxbury, which, now, a little more than ten years ago, was occupied and cultivated by a company of socialists. The author does not wish to deny that he had this community in his mind, and that, having had the good fortune for a time to be personally connected with it, he has occasionally availed himself of his actual reminiscences in the hope of giving a more lifelike tint to the fancy sketch in the following pages. He begs it to be understood, however, that he has considered the institution itself as not less fairly the subject of fictitious handling than the imaginary personages whom he has introduced there. His whole treatment of the affair is altogether incidental to the main purpose of the romance, nor does he put forward the slightest pretensions to illustrate a theory or elicit a conclusion favorable or otherwise in respect to socialism. In short, his present concern with the socialist community is merely to establish a theater, a little removed from the highway of ordinary travel, where the creatures of his brain may play their phantasmagorical antics without exposing them to too close a comparison with the actual events of real lives. In the old countries, with which fiction has long been conversant, a certain conventional privilege seems to be awarded to the romancer. His work is not put exactly side by side with nature, and he is allowed a license with regard to everyday probability in view of the improved effects which he is bound to produce thereby. Among ourselves, on the contrary, there is as yet no such fairyland so like the real world that, in a suitable remoteness, one cannot well tell the difference, but, with an atmosphere of strange enchantment, be held through which the inhabitants have a propriety of their own. This atmosphere is what the American romancer needs. In its absence, the beings of imagination are compelled to show themselves in the same category as actually living mortals, a necessity that generally renders the paint and pasteboard of their composition but too painfully discernible. With the idea of partially obviating this difficulty, the sense of which has always pressed very heavily upon him, the author has ventured to make free with his old and affectionately remembered home at Brook Farm as being, certainly, the most romantic episode of his own life, essentially a daydream, and yet a fact, and thus offering an available foothold between fiction and reality. Furthermore, the scene was in good keeping with the personages whom he desired to introduce. These characters, he feels it right to say, are entirely fictitious. It would indeed, considering how few amiable qualities he distributes among his imaginary progeny, be a most grieving wrong to his former excellent associates were the author to allow it to be supposed that he has been sketching any of their likenesses. Had he attempted it, they would at least have recognized the touches of a friendly pencil. But he has done nothing of the kind. The self-concentrated philanthropist, the high-spirited woman bruising herself against the narrow limitations of her sex, the weakly maiden, whose tremulous nerves endow her with sibylline attributes, the minor poet, beginning life with strenuous aspirations which die out with his youthful fervor, all these might have been looked for at Brook Farm, but, by some accident, never made their appearance there. The author cannot close his reference to this subject without expressing a most earnest wish that some one of the many cultivated and philosophic minds which took an interest in that enterprise might now give the world its history. Ripley, with whom rests the honorable paternity of the institution, Dana, Dwight, Channing, Burton, Parker, for instance, with others whom he dares not name because they veil themselves from the public eye, among these is the ability to convey both the outward narrative and the inner truth and spirit of the whole affair, together with the lessons which those years of thought and toil must have elaborated for the behoof of future experimentalists. Even the brilliant Hawaji might find as rich a theme in his youthful reminiscences of Brook Farm, and a more novel one, close at hand as it lies, than those which he has since made so distant a pilgrimage to seek in Syria and along the current of the Nile. Made at Concord, Massachusetts, May 1852. The end of preface. Read by